sacrifice that he's made and the grace and mercy that he shows us, Lord. Lord, thank you for, for being with us through whatever we go through in life's trials and tribulations. And Lord, if, if uh, someone's here today and they don't understand their own power Christ, Lord, we pray that you uh, are able to, to move them this way, Lord, by the message that's come to you. Lord, please do speak to Brother Andrew.
and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So we have this example that he begins his prayer. He, he said, God, I thank you that I'm not like those bunch of sinners. I thank you I'm not like uh, all these people who, you know, they do bad and, and all these sinners, I, I just thank you that I'm not like them. But he's praying to himself. You see, the Bible tells us plainly, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Even the good people, as we would say, that's a good person. If they do not know Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior and repented of their one sin or two sins, whatever sin or sins, see, the Bible says if you've broken one, you are all breaking. We may call them good, but unless they receive Christ as the Lord and Savior, they're dead in trespasses. So this Pharisee, this, he prayed to himself and he was actually thanking God for his own self-righteousness. So God wouldn't listen to it. God heard the man who asked for his forgiveness and for his mercy. So this is an example of a wrong attitude concerning thanksgiving. This, this Pharisee. You know in Philippians chapter 2, verse 14, the Bible tells us this also about the wrong attitude. It says, Do all things without complaining and disputing. All things without complaining and disputing. You see, when... You know, if you're around someone that all they do is complain, do you like being around somebody like that? Unless you're one that likes to complain, then you kind of feed off of each other, don't you? I don't like it. I don't like I can't believe that. I just can't believe that more than this. And you feed off of each other. But being around someone that complains, or there, they want to have a dispute over everything. It's not fun to be around them, is it? It's not fun. It will destroy every relationship that you want to have. This complaining and disputing over everything. It hinders our walk of faith. You know why? God don't like it either. Although Israelites that would not go into the promised land, they complained. And God said, okay, you're going to stay right where you're at in your complaint. You're going to die in the wilderness. And they didn't enter in the promised land. Here's another example of the wrong attitude of Thanksgiving. Look in Jude, the little, little letter there before the book of Revelation. Look in verse 14 of Jude. Beginning in verse 14. Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men, also saying, Behold, the Lord come with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them all of all their ungodly deeds, which they have committed in an ungodly way, of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Verse 16. You ready? These are grumblers, complainers, walking according to their own lusts, and they mouth great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. You see, griping and complaining this disputing stuff, God don't like it. You know what's going to do? It's going to bring judgment upon you. It will bring swift judgment as those who, would, who were complaining in the wilderness. 
And God was taking care of them and feeding them and, and did great miracles in the land of Egypt that to bring them to where they were at. And God judged them there because of their complaint. Wrong attitude of a thankful heart. The wrong attitude of being grateful. I have some examples now of the right attitude concerning Thanksgiving. There's numerous. You know, the, the ten lepers that Jesus healed. Nine of them went on their way and one leper, a Samaritan, comes back and kneels at Jesus to give them thanks. What a great example of having a grateful and thankful heart. Jesus, when uh, there were 5,000 men and He had preached all day and taught them the day was getting late and, and Jesus said, feed them. That's not counting the women and children. I mean, there was at least 15,000 there. And all they had, one disciple found a little lamb with just some fish and, a, and some bread. And, and you know what Jesus said? He gave a thanksgiving prayer and then asked God to bless what they had. And they fed all those people and had 12 baskets left over. You see, God blesses even more than our needs. That's an example of a grateful, thankful heart. Another great example, I want us to turn there this morning, to 2 Samuel chapter 6. 2 Samuel chapter 6, an example of a right, right attitude concerning thanksgiving. We'll, we'll start in verse 13, but I tell you, this is a, a wonderful story to study and read. 2 Samuel way over in the Old Testament, verse 13. And so it was when those bearing the ark of the Lord had gone six paces that he sacrificed oxen and fatted sheep. Then David danced before the Lord with all his might, and David was wearing a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting, and with the sound of the trumpet. Now as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michelle or Michael, whichever way you want to pronounce her name, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw King David leaping and whirling before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. And you can read what else happened to her and as David went and blessed all the people and went into his own home to bless his home because of the ark of the Lord had come to the city of David. And he danced. The men of that means he literally whirled around in front of the presence of God as he was bringing it to the city of David. And I know some of your Bibles have outlined there and they say, Jerusalem, but the city of David is Bethlehem. Remember? God tabernacled in the flesh was born in Bethlehem, the city of David. Why was this so important? The Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Lord, why was it so important? You see, God commanded Moses and the people there in the wilderness to make the ark. It was about a four foot long, two foot wide, two feet high box. And on each side of the box there was two golden rings where you could run a rod through it and that the priest, only the priest, could carry it. They were consecrated and sanctified to minister before the Lord and to carry 
the ark. And on top of that ark was laid solid gold. And upon that are two cherubim facing each other with their heads and wings bowed down. And that was called the mercy seat. And God said, I'm not going to give you an idol for you to look at. I am a spirit. You will worship me in spirit and in truth. You don't need an idol like the, the paganistic nations around you. Because someday I'm going to come in the flesh. And when you want to see me, you got to look to Jesus and not an idol. But that art, it symbolized the very presence of God among the people. And only the priest could carry it. And, and inside that art were the Ten Commandments. Also, a, a staff or the rod of Aaron that had budded. It was in there. And then later was placed in my ark a jar of manna that spoke of God feeding the nation in the wilderness and how He loved them and took care of them. And all this was in the ark of the covenant, the ark of God. The, the very presence of God among the people. That ark one day was captured by the Philistines. Eli was the judge, the prophet. His two sons played folly before the Lord. And the Philistines was whooping the Israelites and the two boys said, I know, we know what to do. We'll go get the ark. And they went and got the ark of the covenant and and brought it into the camp and the men started shouting, God arise and our, his enemies flee. The Philistines got worried because they were shouting, but the Philistines still whooped them. And they captured that all. The two sons of Eli died. And Eli died also because he would not take care of his two Boys who were doing folly before the Lord. The Philistines were set up by cities, five main cities. And you know what? They would bring that ark to one of the main cities that the Lord of the Philistines were over. And God would plague that city, give the men something like embroids. I don't want that. I don't know what it is, but I don't want it. And mice. And it did all sorts of things. And, and they moved the ark to another city state. And God would plague them. And, and eventually the Philistine says to the Israelites, We don't want your ark anymore. Take it back. They send it back. And some cows bringing that ark back to the Israelites brought it uh, to the place, the house of Abinadab, and it stayed there a very long time. King Saul, Saul was made king. And the leader of God's people, the king, did not concern himself with the ark. The very symbol of God's presence. You know what? I want a leader that's concerned about having the presence of God, don't you? I want the leaders in our state, our nation, our area. I want a leader concerned about the presence of God. You know, men, you're the leader in your home. Are you concerned about the presence of God in your own home? Saul wasn't. And the kingdom was given over to David. David, a man after God's own heart, a 
concerned himself about bringing the ark to his city. You know what Daddy does? He says, uh, you know, let's go get it. Matter of fact, let's do the best for God. We're going to have a brand new cart. And we'll put it on that brand new cart and we'll bring it in. And we're going to sing songs and, 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 and just have a great time bringing the, the symbol of God's presence back on that new cart. And, and the Bible says that an ox stumbled. And Uzzah, doing a good thing, doing what the king commanded, a good man, he was one of David's men, did a good thing. You know what he did? He reached his hand towards the ark of God, the ark of the covenant, and he touched it to keep it from falling, and God struck him dead. If you want to do good, you better get in the book and do it the right way. Amen? God's, his, God's anger struck him down right there. And that worried David. He said, oh, wait a minute. Something's not right. Well, they put the ark for three months at Old Head Edom's house. The Bible says that Obed Edom's house was blessed. His, he was blessed. His family was blessed. His wife was blessed. His children, everybody that would go in the house was blessed by God. And word came back to David and said, he said, I got to bring the ark back to the city. We need that blessing and presence of God. They start reading the book, the Bible. And only the priest could carry the ark. So they, they got the priest together and, and all the people and, you know, the priest, one on each side was carrying the ark. And the Bible said that they would take six steps. And the trumpets would blow and music and they shouted to God in praise and worship. And David said, I, I just can't take it. Just send my chariot on. And he gets in front of the people and in front of the priest and he starts rolling around before the ark of God in thanksgiving and in worship. The king. Now this ain't no weirdo that's doing it. This is not just somebody that, that's making a big show of it. This was a mighty man who killed a lion, who killed a bear, who stood when all the army of Israel would not, and went and stood before the lion and killed the lion as a youth. This was a man that the Philistines were afraid of and the Amalekites were afraid of because he was a mighty man of God a warrior of God and the enemies of God were destroyed before King David. This wasn't a little boy just playing around. This was a man, a man's man that gave God thanksgiving in such a way that he did not care what other people were thinking. Even his own wife peering out the window uh, had something in her heart that dismayed what he was doing. And he said, I don't care. I'm going to give God thanksgiving. And he was a man. That's a good example of thanksgiving, is it not? They brought that ark of the covenant back to the city of David, and the ark of God, and, and there it was placed in the tabernacle, the tent of the dwelling place. You know, if you read the book of Revelation, there won't be no temple in heaven because the tabernacle of God will be present among us. You know who that is? Jesus Christ. God tabernacled in the flesh. We're going to walk with God and, and we will be His children.
children is going to wipe away our tears and the very, very presence of God will be in our midst. Amen? What a day that will be. But right now, you're called a tabernacle. Did you know that? Right now, you're called actually the temple of the Holy Spirit of God. And folks, if you're born again this morning, you have something to be thankful for, don't you? Yes. How Jesus has washed away your sins, forgiven you, blessed you, and now you are consecrated, you are sanctified, set apart for the work of God, a peculiar people, a royal priesthood. That's what the Bible, God's Word, calls every one of us as born again believers. And you carry the presence of God everywhere you go, in your heart and in your life. That's all I've been thankful for. Matter of fact, the man who danced before God, before the people, says this in Psalm 95. Psalm 95, verse 1. O come, let us sing to the Lord, let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before His presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to Him with psalms. Look in Psalm 100, verses 4 and 5. Enter into His gates with thanksgiving, and into His courts with praise. Be thankful to Him, and bless His name. For the Lord is good, His mercy is everlasting, and His truth endures to all generations. I want some little child saying that. I wasn't a weirdo saying that. That was a mighty man's man. King David that wrote that and danced and with a grateful and thankful heart for the presence of God. Thankful for the presence of God. Church, stand with me this morning. Song of praise. Church, I want you to just stand there. Lost people around you may try to complain. But will you just, I know we're Southern Baptists, but will you join me this morning just giving God praise, will you? Will you? Will you lift up your hands and just say thank you, God, for your presence in my life and, and thank you all your blessings and if you'd like to have God's presence in your life this morning be safe I'll be here to help you but as we sing will you just praise God with you this morning
you're going through a hardship right now in your life, just lift up your heart and uh, to the Lord and say, thank you, Lord, because I know on the other side of this, you're going to be blessed. Let's close this time of worship and prayer, but continue to have a heart of worship and thanksgiving in your life. Brother Paul, would you close this